unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Damasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. It's hard to believe, but it's been more than two months since our news roundup regulars have been on the show. I'm very happy to be joined once more by Sadhanand Dume of the American Enterprise Institute and the Wall Street Journal. Sadhanand, welcome to the show. Good to be back. And Tanvi Madan at the Brookings Institution. Tanvi, good to see you. Good to see you too, Milan. Uh, today on the show, we're going to discuss three topics. Number one, the political state of affairs in India in light of the pandemic and recent state assembly elections. Number two, the foreign policy ramifications of the COVID second wave. And number three, we'll end with a discussion of the social media wars currently playing out in India. But let's start with our first topic, which is the political scene. Uh, Previously on the show, we have highlighted many of the different public health aspects of the current crisis. But Sadhanand, I want to ask you about the political roots of the COVID second wave. You had this to say in a recent Wall Street Journal column, quote, any prime minister would likely have struggled to cope with the pandemic's brutal second wave, but Modi's overweening vanity overly centralized style of governance, and relentless focus on electoral advantage made him particularly unsuited to the task, end quote. What burden of responsibility does the Modi government carry in terms of the crisis that's been unfolding, you know, for the past several weeks now? I think, Milan, any fair analysis would say that the Modi government carries a very high responsibility for just how severe the second wave of the pandemic has been in India. Uh, This is not to say that any government would have found it easy to cope once this new mutant, which is much more transmissible, had emerged. Um, And it's also fair to point out that many of India's problems, including uh, having relatively few hospital beds uh, and so on, are are legacy issues that go back decades. But there are specific aspects of Modi's style of governance that I think all came together to make this particularly bad. Uh, one big point was that he declared victory too early. There this, this tendency to uh, preen for uh, global approbation. And I think India moved very fast to claim that it had defeated COVID when in fact it hadn't. You have the self-reliance program, and one could debate this, but um, arguably the, his, his tom-toming this idea of self-reliance may have something to do with the fact that as late as April 11th, India had approved only two vaccines for use. You have the fact that the BJP relies very much on uh, on godmen and such figures for political mobilization. And this may have something to do with the fact that they were unwilling. Uh, not only were they unwilling to crack down on the Kun Mela, uh, on the on on the on the banks of the river Ganges, but in fact you had full page advertisements with Modi on them, welcoming people to this. Uh, it turned out to be what many people call the world's greatest the greatest super spreader event in history. And now, of course, if you say that, the BJP will accuse you of some of being part of the toolkit gang conspiring against them. So I think that you know the, the so the short answer is that. Uh, Yes, this was a difficult situation, and, and to, to that extent, the government and Modi deserve a certain amount of sympathy, but I don't think you should dodge the blame for its being as bad as it was. So can I just push you on this a little bit? Because the defense the government has mounted is that under the Constitution, health is a state subject, and if you go back to the first COVID wave, many of the states were up in arms that the that the that the center was doing too much had centralized the response they wanted a more decentralized approach so um, is the government right in saying you know what this the states have to lead yeah, to a certain extent right you can say that there is shared responsibility and so I would not entirely absolve state governments some have been better than others nor would I entirely absolve the public right the fact is that many 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 people. Uh, felt that that India had beaten COVID or that India had some sort of special immunity and this and India was going to um, get away relatively lightly. Uh, nonetheless, I think that there are many aspects of this that were firmly in the central government's hands. The state governments have not could not decide which which vaccines India was going to approve or not. Uh, there are many aspects of this that are very centralized, and the fact is that when things appear to be going well. The government, the Modi government, the central government was very quick to take credit. And the idea that the state governments must must carry the can uh, only emerged when things started going south. 
So Thunberg, let me bring you in on this. I think it's you know fair to say the government has spent quite a lot of time on image management during this crisis. You know, they feel like they're on the back foot, they're on the defensive. We're going to talk a little bit later about social media companies, but we've seen a full court press in terms of you know WhatsApp forwards, uh, PIB statements, <laughs> BJP toolkits, uh, and 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 the like from the government supporters. How do you think, as you step back, the government's image has been affected in the kind of broader public sphere? So first, I have to say, Milan, and you know, you know, this is my pet peeve. So I have to say this: that optics and image and all these questions should not be the priority. The only toolkit we should be hearing about is the toolkit to stop the spread of COVID and to deal with the COVID the cases that exist. Um, I'm not saying that kind of perceptions don't matter; that they don't matter at all, but. I do think they need to be kind of put in the right place. And the best way at the end of the day to improve optics or image or narrative is to improve the substance. Um, and, the, and the example of that is the US, where a year ago, if you remember, there was such despondency here and for months afterwards, right through to the fall. And this, you can compare it and contrast it with the optimism today. And it's because of the outcome. So you know, I do think at the end of the day, it is going to be about kind of the, the health and economic outcomes, et cetera. In terms of the image, and I think those will affect the government's image over time. In terms of the present day, I think it's it's hard to make generalizations about the effect uh, on the government's image. We do have a couple of polls. Uh, There was a C voter poll that showed um, that those answering that they were very satisfied uh, with Prime Minister Modi's performance uh, went down from sixty five percent a year ago to about thirty seven percent. We had a some kind of morning consult data, which said that you know there was a twenty two percent drop in 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 the prime minister's approval rating uh, in April, though it still stands at a pretty healthy sixty you know sixty three sixty four percent um but you know this comes with all the caveats about polling in India. I think we can perhaps make a few observations about what we you know we just see um and hear uh, about where we're seeing impact. I think some of them is, I think you have seen some impact on perception of the prime minister's sense of empathy. Um, I think you have seen commentary, for example, on what this says about the a government that has portrayed itself as effective, as a good kind of implementer of policy. And you can argue that, you know, that was not a right perception, but nonetheless, a, a perception existed both at home And abroad, I think you have seen an impact in terms of seeing the prime minister almost go from uh, omnipresence, where everywhere you looked, there was a sign of the prime minister to much less visibility. And in some in some kind of days and weeks, invisibility. And you've seen a lot of commentary on that. Um, You're also not seeing the kind of defense from the government's own supporters um, that you usually see. Um, and, And sometimes that's quite assertive, but you're not seeing that. And I think you're also seeing some supporters of the government who have actually been critical, if not of, uh, sometimes they won't criticize the prime minister, but they will you know, critique the government's performance. Um, and clearly the government is worried about this themselves and the party is worried, the BJP is worried about this because you see them trying different narratives every day to counter these, um, these kind of uh, images or, or the you know, narratives that they are emerging from amongst the public. Um, I will add one more thing. I mean, you asked about kind of kind of in the broader public sphere in India, but I think the other thing that is related to the foreign policy side is I do think there has been a hit to uh, to a certain extent in terms of the public's um, perception of vaccine diplomacy. Um, I think there was a lot of support for this idea that India was, you know, providing vaccines to large parts of the world and that fit with the image of India kind of garnering respect on the world stage being a global player. And I think you've seen now, and this is not just opposition parties, there are people in the public asking, why were we exporting vaccines? You could say they're commercial supplies, et cetera. But nonetheless, I do think you've seen uh, that take a hit, the Indian ability to be able to do this kind of vaccine metry. Um, sending vaccines abroad has taken a hit even amongst the Indian public. And at the end of the day, it shows that India's ability to do things internationally will very much depend on and be affected by what happens at home. 
You know, Sadhana, one way to answer this question, of course, is to look at what the recent state elections tell us, right? So we had voters in five states go to the polls to select new regional governments. The BJP retained the state of Assam, which it controlled, but it lost really the big battle in West Bengal to Mamta Banerjee and Trinamool Congress in a pretty de- decisive fashion. Uh, the BJP-led alliance did triumph in the sort of city-state of, of Puducherry, but came up very short both in Tamil Nadu and in Kerala, two other large southern states. What message do you take from these state assembly results? So, you know, on, there, there are no surprises really in either Kerala or Tamil Nadu where the BJP has historically been very weak. The big prize and the biggest setback, of course, is what happened in Bengal. Not because the BJP has been strong there historically, but because it had performed well in the Lok Sabha election and there were expectations that it would do much better. And of course, the government and the party, uh, they went all out to conquer Bengal. Now, there are various ways to slice this, and some people have sort of looked at this as, for example, some kind of uh, referendum on uh, Modi's handling of COVID. But I I think that's not accurate, uh, because a lot of the voting actually took place before the second wave crisis became, uh, became clear. To me, the most interesting thing is whether these election results suggest that there are geographical boundaries that Hindu nationalism will struggle uh, struggle to overcome. And if you look at, for example, the religious demographics in Bengal, where between 25 and 30 percent of the population is Muslim, it becomes very interesting because what you see in play is a form of Hindu nationalism that the Modi and Amit Shah have fostered, particularly since 2017 when they appointed Yogi Adityanath to be chief minister of uh, Uttar Pradesh, which is, to put it mildly, shall we say, quite aggressive. And, the, and that has obviously paid dividends for them uh, in the Hindi heartland and in other parts of the country. But what I wonder is whether that kind of aggressive, in-your-face a uh, brand of Hindu nationalism, which is frankly quite hostile and overtly hostile to uh, religious minorities, but specifically Muslims and Christians, really is going to have much purchase beyond the Hindi heartland and some Western states. Now, of course, a BJP supporter may sort of go may may respond with the Assam counterfactual because the Assam popu- the Muslim population in Assam is in fact greater than the Muslim population in uh, West Bengal in proportional terms. But I think Assam is a special case because of the nature of ethnic politics in Assam. Um, And in some ways, what we're seeing in Bengal and what we're seeing in Kerala is uh, much more suggestive of exactly how far the BJP can expect to go unless it finds a way to either retool nationally or finds a way to deliver a a differentiated product in different states uh, so that its national brand does not get in the way of its expanding in these states. So so I take your point and I think it's a it's a valid one but you know I think the pushback would be then how do you explain what happened in 2019 when the BJP did very well in Bengal it also did very well uh, in another state Orissa where it has traditionally um and not been a massive player um this brand of Hindu nationalism seemed to have paid dividends there. So is there something else going on in terms of, you know, state versus national elections? So I think there are two things. First of all, there is definitely something going on in state versus national elections. Um, and many more people voted for Modi as prime minister than who would, than who would have voted for uh, the BJP per se. And in the states, we're finding that Modi cannot offer himself up as chief minister. So that sort of the Modi effect has much less effect in, uh, is, is, much, is, is much less important in states than it is in national elections. But the second point related to the undoubted gains that they've made in Bengal is that one, one way of looking at this is that this form of mobilization may in fact dramatically raise the BJP's floor, but does it at the same time impose a ceiling? At least that's how I look at it. Um, let's switch gears now and talk about foreign policy. Um, Thunby, this is uh, actually quite an important week in some ways because the External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar is in the United States as we record here on Thursday afternoon. He's meeting with a whole litany of senior officials while he's here in town. 
Uh, tell us a little bit about what you think the minister's mission is this week, and how will we know if it's a success? Um, so I think there are kind of two dimensions of the strip, right? One is the New York leg of his visit to the U.S., which was about kind of India's uh, permanent member, of the, a non-permanent member of the Security Council for the next two years, and so planning around kind of that um, and showing the flag, so to speak, meeting the Secretary General. Um, as well. I think the other aspect is, of course, the Washington aspect that you talked about. Um, here again, you could break it down in with kind of the, the minister having two objectives, or broadly two objectives in, one, uh, in mind. One is to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of maintaining the partnership, which is a the U.S.-India partnership, which for India is, a, if not the crucial partnership, at least a crucial partnership um, as it thinks about its security, economic, global objectives, and a, a partnership that, if anything, this crisis has reinforced. Um, and and remember, this is while you know obviously the COVID wave has is what is front and center on everybody's mind. You still have the other two crises, which is kind of the economic challenges that this will throw up, and the China crisis, which is still ongoing. So. In each one of those realms and each one of those crises makes the U.S. partnership even more important. So this needs to be thought about as Dr. Jayashankar coming. uh, This is the first major visit uh, that an Indian kind of senior official is making with the Biden administration. Um, Because of all these kind of virtual meetings, we think, oh, you know, they've been meeting and in the U.S., like with the Biden administration, um, we have not seen a visit. We saw Sec- Defense Secretary Austin um, and uh, climate change kind of um, envoy uh, John Kerry go to India. Uh, but other than kind of a Blinken meeting in um, in London uh, with Jay Shankar, you have not seen a visit here. And so this gives uh, Dr. Jay Shankar an opportunity to meet you know officials across the board, touch base, see what the priorities are, where the differences might be in touching base in various aspects of the relationship, not just kind of COVID related, and I'll come to that, but um, everything from defense and security objectives, economic ones, you know, we're still waiting for that mini trade deal, for example, and what might happen happen uh, there, supply chains, um, you know, uh, others kind of cooperation. And so I think, you know, touching base with the new administration, but also touching base with other constituencies, right? So there's a new Congress as well, a Congress that is now kind of um, um, uh, led by Democrats in, in, in both the Senate and House. So again, you know, different committee members, et cetera, uh, but also touching base with the business community. Um, all three of these constituencies are important and kind of, uh, you know, civil society as well. All these constituencies are also important for what perhaps is the most urgent objective um, for the Jay Shankar visit, which is kind of COVID-related. And I think, you know, here I see that there are probably a couple of different uh, sub-objectives, one of which is clearly, you know, about dealing with the current crisis. So things like vaccine production capacity, uh, talking to, you know, companies here that produce vaccines, talking to the administration about the potential of, you know, some of the, ex- uh, you know, the vaccines that they do have going to India, though I, there are many other countries who want those vaccines as well and might get priority. Um, but the, I, I think perhaps the kind of, uh, topmost on, on the minister's mind might be kind of the uh, unlocking some of the supply chains in terms of the raw materials and trying to get those, um, some of those, um, you know, those export restrictions or, or policies changed um, so that Indian vaccine production capacity is increased. And I'll just finally say, I, I suspect in a COVID-related aspect, part of the reason for the visit is also to kind of provide some reassurance uh, of Indian recovery that look, um, we understand that the U.S. has put, invested a lot in India as a particular kind of country that has capabilities and willingness to do certain things, whether strategic, economic, etc. And that even though we are going through this crisis, uh, you know, we are tackling it and we we are still committed to doing all these other things. So I think there is that reassurance aspect as well. So, Sadhana, so you know, I've been asked this question by a lot of people, and I'm wondering how how you think about it. Which is, you know, to what degree, if at all, has the COVID second wave changed how the U.S. government views Modi and his administration? You know, I hear a lot of people now whispering um, things uh, along the lines of, "Well, you know, we have certain interests where we converge, but um, it's clear that you know there's a divergence." on the values question in many ways. Do you think that 
that this crisis has brought out a kind of shift in how American policymakers might view the Modi administration? No, I don't have a good answer to that question, Alan. I, I, I think that on a lot of the big questions, really, and then I raised this point in a Wall Street Journal column, my, the, my, my latest column, a lot of these big questions are going to really depend on how India fares between now and the end of the year. Uh, there is no doubt that India has been hammered by the COVID second wave and that the government's reputation has taken a beating for mismanagement. Uh, and that comes along with uh, many concerns about the values uh, piece of the relationship. But a lot is going to depend on whether they are able to uh, basically avert a third wave. And if they are able to do that on many substantive questions, I think they will get the benefit of the doubt on issues such as Indian capability, uh, the value of India as a potential counterweight to China, the importance of India as an engine of global economic growth. A lot of these things are going to depend on how this plays out. But for now, it's certainly true that uh, this, that the the severity of the second wave uh, has raised questions about a bunch of issues, and those questions are, are are not questions that India would have liked to see raised. Sanvi, I want to uh, bring in China for a moment. You know, there are some commentators who are arguing that India's curbs on vaccine exports, which you alluded to earlier, which were brought about because of its own vaccine stumbles and and sort of the crisis at home, you know, this has essentially gifted China a big diplomatic opportunity uh, on a silver platter, as it were. Uh, to what extent do we think that China is kind of pressing its advantage? A and if so, to, to, to what effect? So I think there are a couple of different things here. One is, you know, what, are, what, what is China doing? And second, is it effective? And, I mean, in terms of what they're doing, their pandemic diplomacy, um, you know, precedes India's second wave. Earlier, you saw it, I think, you know, this time last year, you saw it with masks and medical equipment. And then kind of, you know, more recently, you've seen it with their own vaccine export efforts. Um, what they have been doing, uh, you've seen at least in the, in the context, though, of India's um, COVID surge, is one, you know, highlighting um, supplies to India, which has caused some consternation in India because there's a sense of them highlighting these commercial supplies and fulfilling commercial supplies as assistance when it's really just you know, fulfilling contracts. I think that the, what you see Beijing also do is target kind of India's neighborhood and try to kind of, you know, this competition between India, China and the neighborhood in terms of pandemic diplomacy goes right to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I think you have seen China doubling down on that, especially with India focused primarily at home. And I think, you know, and, and unable to deliver some of the promised supplies of vaccines in particular because of, you know, vaccine metry and diplomacy being put on on hold. So China kind of stepping in and saying, you know, we'll help you out. Nepal will give you, you know, one million doses of vaccines. I think they've also, you know, you've seen China kind of, even if not Beijing as the government, but a number of their kind of um, state media outlets point also point to kind of India's deficiencies. Um, so, you know, and, and this fits very much with kind of their broader idea that India is kind of can be a messy, chaotic country uh, and democracies can be messy and chaotic. And so you've seen kind of them highlight kind of India's deficiencies, one in terms of tackling COVID, but then also going straight at the case that Prime Minister Modi was making that, you know, India is more reliable, is the place where you want to kind of bring your business if you're thinking about diversifying or China plus one strategies and very much targeting that saying, look, this is not the country that, you know, you, um, uh, that you, you know, India was making it out to be that, you know, China is the better bet anyway. Uh, it's actually quite similar to what the, the China has been doing with the U.S., highlighting deficiencies. They've also, interestingly, China kind of been highlighting within India, but the neighborhood U.S. deficiencies first kind of saying, oh, you know, the U.S. didn't wasn't uh, providing aid. And then um, also pointing to things like, oh, you know, it, the U.S. has not been exporting vaccines while we have. Of course, you know, once President Biden said we're going to export 80 million doses by the end of June, um, then, you know, China's criticism has been, well, um, you know, that's just being done for geopolitical purposes. So you, you have seen them be very active. I think it's an open question how effective 
uh, it's going to be. I think it's premature because one thing COVID has taught us is every time we think a narrative, country will make a narrative, you know, we've succeeded. Three months later, you see, you know, not so much. So, you know, I remember when China first started getting mass diplomacy in Europe, everybody's like, oh, no, you know, they're going to have a big win. And then they were so obvious about it and seemed to take advantage that the Europeans got really annoyed with them. Um, so I think, you know, that story is out. But I do think in terms of there, you see them, it's what they're doing, targeting different audiences for their own domestic audiences. And that might be effective, right? You're saying we as a non-democracy have helped tackle this and look at India next door. They're not doing well. Do you really want that kind of democracy? Um, you're seeing the neighborhood audience uh, where they're saying, you know, um, that, you know, we are more effective as a service provider and a provider of goods than India is. And they might have some success, but at the same time, their own wolf warriors, and we saw this with the Chinese ambassador in Bangladesh, kind of stomping all over the, the you know, there's the a soft power by kind of dictating, uh, you know, trying to dictate Bangladesh's foreign policy choices. Um, and then, of course, you know, as I said, there's an Indian audience saying, look, we can come and help you. Again, though, stomping all over that uh, with um, you know their their commercial suppliers raising rates, blocking cargo flights, etc. And then finally, you know, kind of they are targeting a global audience. We don't know how effective that case will be. That look, India is not living up to the hype that you have either strategically or, or um, economically. And I there, I'm very much on the same page as Sadan is, which a lot of that will depend on how India fares over the next uh, next few months. So uh, can I just get you both to reflect on something before we go to our third topic? Uh, I'm sure you caught the comments that Kurt Campbell made yesterday at an event out in Stanford. Uh, Kurt, of course, is the the Indo-Pacific coordinator at the National Security Council. When he, and I'm paraphrasing here, said that the era of cooperation or engagement with China has come to an end and we're entering a, a new universe um, where the dominant paradigm is going to be competition. Um, these remarks land uh, as Jay Shankar is landing here in Washington. Sadan, and how will this kind of language, do you think, be received in New Delhi? Um, I think that that era has already begun in New Delhi earlier, right? This is sort of, uh, this is something I think Tanvi has mentioned all, all elsewhere. And it's quite striking to see, for example, how enthusiastically uh, Indian uh, intellectual elites have taken to the story that uh, the coronavirus was in fact a, a leak from a lab in Wuhan. And that's just sort of, you know, one little data point. But I think that that's certainly, uh, I would imagine it would be welcome because the, the, there's, there's absolutely no question that uh, India sees itself in a competition. Now, the debate, the jury is out on how effective India will be in that competition. But uh, there's certainly the, the fact that, that, that the relationship is marked more by competition than by cooperation. I don't think anybody doubts, uh, at, least, at, at, least, uh, at least for the past year. Danvi, I just want to take you back to your book launch at Brookings, where Kurt Campbell was present and said something to the effect of, you know, oftentimes our, our Indian friends would get mad at us because we said the quiet part out loud, which, which they agreed with, but then they'd sort of like, why did you say that out loud? Um, does this have that same kind of ring, or do you think at this point, um, you know, the, the the both sides are pretty much on the same page in terms of how they're messaging this publicly? I, I suspect Kurt himself has seen that since you know he was last in government, how much the kind of Indian competitive view of China has solidified uh, and intensified not least because of developments in 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 um, the last year alone. But even, I would say, for the last few years, uh, you've had two pretty intense boundary crises, uh, not to mention a whole other set of developments. And so I think, you know, he's... he's and, and this is why even things like a Quad Summit are possible, which, you know, going in, um, maybe the administration would have had doubts if India would have agreed to something like that, particularly as India was in you know, crucial and sensitive disengagement talks with China. You know, I, th I, I heard people here express, um, uh, you know, some uncertainty whether India would agree. So, you know, I'm, I, I, I think part of it is that both the U.S. and India 
have now moved into a phase where attempts, and I'm, I, I think neither country is not going to engage in various ways. Um, but I do think the, because uh, just it's a, you know, they're interdependent countries and, um, you know, if at the very least have to engage with each other in things like multilateral fora for India, China as a neighbor at the end of the day. And even as it's dealing with COVID, most of the, a lot, a lot of the commercial supplies are coming from China. Having said that, I do think, you know, where India and the U.S. have moved to is kind of giving up on this idea that A, engagement was the organizing principle and B, that engagement was actually going to change China in ways or alleviate the political strains. Uh, And I think both India and the U.S. are past that. So I think, you know, when Delhi hears kind of Kurt rather say those things, I think probably three reactions. One it's high time the U.S. got to this point. Second, a certain amount of relief that the Biden administration, there's continuity on China, uh, at least in a broader view. Um, And India would actually prefer some of the adjustments and approach that uh, Biden administration has made from the Trump administration. And third, um, I actually think there might be pause, but not for the reason you think. I think the pause might be um, that India will now be... Now, you know, you have a U.S. that has is very focused to Biden administration, and they might actually want India to be more forward-leaning in a way that <laughs> he early wanted the U.S. to be forward-leaning um, at a time when they might think, oh, you know, um, what, what might be asked to do. But I, I do think we're, um, we're, we're kind of in a much more intense phase of competition. competition and uh, the, one of the reasons I think the U.S. and India are in sync on a lot of the strategic side and, and the economic and technology is that there's more convergence today in both perceptions and approach uh, than there was, um, you know, three, four, five years ago, and definitely a decade ago. Uh, let's turn now the, to our final topic, which is um, social media. Sadan and I don't even know where to start. We've had such an insane couple of weeks when it comes to freedom of expression issues in India. Um, let me start with a little bit of background for our listeners. Um, the most recent turn of events began when Sambit Patra, who is a national BJP spokesperson, most of us are used to seeing him on television, tweeted screenshots of a social media toolkit that he alleged the Congress party used to try to defame and discredit the Modi government's handling of the pandemic. The Congress uh, almost immediately claimed the toolkit was fake. Uh, Twitter eventually took the decision uh, to label Sambit Patra's tweet, quote, manipulated media, which is a step that, you know, I think they take uh, um, w- with a great deal of, uh, of, of forethought. Just days later, the Delhi police show up at Twitter's headquarters in a, in a supposed raid, although, you know, <laughs> because of the pandemic, all the offices are closed and no one is there. Uh, this was a move that drew widespread criticism, uh, including from some newspapers, which have, let's say, not been exactly very um, harsh when it comes to uh, analyzing this government's actions. What do you make of this roller coaster ride like is there something that we should glean from this or is this just like in a soap opera i don't think it's a soap opera i mean it has soap operatic elements but i think this is very serious um what the government is finding and what the bjp is finding is that the very tools that were very helpful to it when it was in opposition could now be turned against it and at a time when it has uh, browbeaten or intimidated or cajoled, pick your cho- word, um, large chunks of the national media, particularly television news and Hindi television news, uh, it finds that social media is really where criticism of the prime minister and the government is freest, and its instincts are to throttle it. So that's what's happening. That's the kind of you know underlying story. And one of the things that I'm struck by in the conversations that BJP supporters have on this issue is that they don't even seem particularly interested in what the truth is. They're not particularly concerned whether the document was a forgery or not a forgery. Uh, As far as they're concerned, Sambit Patra is their guy. And so how dare Twitter say this? How dare you say that this was manipulated media and slap a label on a BJP spokesperson? And they are turning this into an issue of national sovereignty. And what I find ironic is that 
some of the same people, you know, uh, you, some, you, both of you might remember that back in 2012, the UPA had tried to uh, ban a few Twitter accounts, and those were, of course, disproportionately BJP-leaning accounts. And at the time, I had written against it and I had criticized it in the Wall Street Journal. And many of the same people who today are calling for Twitter to be banned because it's an outrage against India's sovereignty were the same people who were cheering on the opposite argument, which was that, in fact, Twitter allowed for there to be a, a, a more open and a freer political discourse in India because it was not controlled. But I'm actually quite pessimistic in terms of where I think this is going. And it's because the government finds itself on the defensive over its mishandling of the pandemic. It's because the prime minister's approval ratings are at a low. And uh, this is their way of responding to criticism, unfortunately. You know, Thunvi, so Sidanand feels there, you know, there are larger implications. You said this on Twitter. Taking this step, uh, referring to the, the raid on Twitter, will change the discussion from Twitter or Facebook's arbitrary processes, which require more transparency, to Government of India actions and sense of priority. So in your view, kind of what is the genuine issue concerning social media companies' behavior that you think might be getting lost or getting obscured by this kind of sideshow of the police and these kind of heavy-handed tactics? So I think, you know, this is part of a broader global debate about these companies, right? And this is taking place in the US, it's taking place in the European Union, it's taking place in Australia, and of course, India, which is about the power of these social company, uh, uh, social media companies that, you know, people today would argue, some argue that they should be treated more like utilities, um, than kind of, you know, intermediaries in a way that, you know, they're just normal companies. So kind of one, what's the nature of these companies? Second, the use of the power that they have as, as these platforms. And then third, the question of their accountability. Who do they answer to? Um, you, know, in, you know, they would argue, oh, you know, investors and, and, you know, if they're public companies and they'd say shareholders. But given the kind of power, I think these debates are not going anywhere. And so the companies say, oh, leave us to our own devices. We'll regulate ourselves. You know, we'll have... We'll set our own rules and look, these are the terms and conditions. The issue becomes, is the application of those rules. The decision-making, the processes aren't exactly transparent. And I don't care which side of the political debate you stand on in either the US or India, you can find cases where you can argue that their decisions, whether to you know, ban an account or delete certain posts, are entirely arbitrary. So you, in the kind of Indian case, it's like, oh, so, you know, when the government requested that these companies delete certain tweets that were critical of the government, and when you look at them, the, the tweets, some of them just seem like regular criticism and not kind of a national sovereignty threat or a security threat. Um, or, you know, what the Congress party used to say when, when they were asking for some of these bans and all, they used the word, well, you know, if they're inflammatory, uh, you know, that lies in the beholder. Inflammatory in what sense? Inflammatory because it's going to hurt a certain politician's feelings? You know, that was that was the case when the Congress made the argument. And you can argue the BJP is doing the same. So you will say that, you know, the social media companies should not also be taking these decisions arbitrarily to delete these posts um, as well. Or you can say, you know, the, uh, why is, you know, why, how come certain, they, they act on certain things, you know, a BJP supporter would say, why are you only labeling that as manipulated and not the other? So I think, I mean, I, I think there it does need to be transparency about Having said that, I think this lack of transparency and consistency is also a government problem. Uh, if this was pr about principle and not politics, as Sadan pointed out, then why are you only asking for certain accounts to uh, or certain you know accounts to be banned or this thing, which are only happen to be criticizing the government's actions versus some principle you know violating some principle in an inflammatory sense in terms of you know national sovereignty. So, and, and this is, by the way, not just something uh, you can make a criticism, but it's not just with the central government. The various state governments do, of all stripes, which is, you know, take this very forward-leaning and heavy-handed approach to these questions um, of, you know, what kind of speeches these, these platforms should require. And I think the Indian public, and all publics for that matter, should be expecting and demanding more of companies and governments in terms of transparency and consistency in terms of rules and processes. 
And when it comes to the government, I think, you know, people should remember that today there might be a government you like that is making the rules and demanding the company to kind of listen to them. And you're fine with that. But uh, with what they're asking these companies to do. But tomorrow there might be another party in power and they will use those same rules um, to censor you. And will you be all, all the all the kind of opposition that you support? So are you okay with that? And as Sadan said, many people today might say yes, because you you know parties of like people sometimes think they're immortal. But I do think there are larger principles beyond kind of the polarized questions at play. So so quick thing to each of you. Um... Where does this end, right? I mean, we have new rules coming out this week from the government, which govern the conduct of so-called social media intermediaries. Many tech companies are up in arms saying that these are extremely cumbersome, potentially will have a chilling effect on free speech. Uh, as we were discussing before the program today, WhatsApp is taking the government to court, has just filed a suit in the Delhi High Court. Um, real quick reaction, Sadhanand, do you think that these recent events could actually call into question the viability of these companies to do business in India? So I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that this puts them in a, in a real bind. Now, what I find quite ironic about the, you know, about the BJP being uh, upset about uh, Patra's tweet being called manipulated media is that this is a political party which, in fact, quite publicly has exalted in its capacity to manipulate media. There was a very famous incident a couple of years ago where uh, the, part, the then party president, uh, Amit Shah, I believe he was still party president at the time, pointed out that the BJP had created a messaging machine that could essentially, you know, say night is day and day is night. Um, I, I believe there was an incident where they, one sort of very small, a very important example of this where they started a rumor that Akhilesh Yadav, the, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, had slapped his father, Mulayam Singh Yadav. There was absolutely no truth in this, but it, obviously it was something that was damning to him because it spoke to, damning because it spoke directly to his character. This was a lie. It was a complete fabrication. And it was spread assiduously um, by the party's fellow travelers. So they, in fact, do not seem to have some great, you know, uh, attachment to the truth. And what they have is an attachment, a very sort of tribal sense of solidarity, it depends on who's doing the lying. And so if Twitter were, in fact, to, to take this seriously, um, I would say that a large chunk of the uh, BJP uh, ecosystem uh, would actually, you know, be uh, be threatened. So this sort of puts them in a bind because, on the other hand, people in the U.S. are going to be looking at this very carefully. And if they do back down, which is which is quite possible, then it would essentially show that they are paper tigers. They are willing to go after Trump when Trump is no longer in office, but when they face a government or a, or a political party that actually threatens them with a stick. That they step down. So either way, uh, I think they're going to be in trouble. So they're no. I, I, I'm. I'm. I would not want to be in uh, Twitter's place right now. Uh, Tanvi, quick reactions. I mean, I, I think I approach this very cynically, um, uh, thinking that the companies are going to do whatever it takes because that market is so important to them. But what do you think? What's the end game? So, I mean, I was just laughing at Sadanam's thing because basically, is when when I do it, it's messaging. When you do it, it's manipulation. And don't. Don't say the quiet part out loud, right? If we do it, it's it's fine. Um, but you could say the same about toolkits, right? I mean, toolkits sure. are something that like every NGO from here to India uses on a regular basis. It's not, uh, and it's uh, political parties of all stripes in India use them as well. You're speaking like a member of the toolkit gang, Milan. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, maybe that's actually what the what, what this news roundup should be called is the toolkit. So gang. the toolkit. Gang. Look, I wish I had toolkits because I'd be more be part of one because my life would probably be more organized. I mean, it, it, what is a toolkit, right? The BJP actually as a party has probably mastered the art of it and other parties are now playing catch up in some ways and, and copying what they did because they were so successful. A toolkit at the end of the day is a, you know, it's got these nefarious reasons, but the literal meaning of the term is a kind of plan, whether that's in this case a communications plan and then, you know, how you actually implement it with different instruments. Um, uh, you know, and that's a separate matter. But I, I do think, in terms of the the companies, 
Um, I think the, it really depends. It, there, there are two ways to think about, it. and not just I think for social media companies in India, but I think you've had this conversation. That you've heard others like content creation platforms like Netflix and 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 um, Prime that have had to deal with some of these uh, legislation issues, uh, but also some of the kind of shared um, shared economy companies. I mean, these three kind of category of companies, a lot of them, you put them in the in the from the tech side on the software side. So it's not like the Apples of this world or the Teslas of this world, but from kind of the software side, they have looked to India in part because it is the un-China and because they've been, you know, uh, uh, shut out of China. And so it could result on the one hand in them deciding that if India is in their eyes at the end of the day, then behaving like China from their perception, then what's the point of being in this in this market anyway? On the other hand, you could say that because they've been shut out of the China market, that you they need the India market too much, and so they can't leave. Uh, obviously, the Indian government is banking on the latter, I think, and, and hoping that these companies blink. I think what each company decides to do, and I do not think this will necessarily be the same choice for every company, uh, will depend on a few different factors, including you know how crucial their operations in India are in terms of their valuations, in terms of revenue, you know, are there parts are there parts of larger conglomerates that have other business interests in India that they need to protect? Um, how much impact going along with uh, the Indian government's demands could have on their global brands? But also, how much of a precedent they'll set for their operations in other countries? Because you know, if they if they go along in one country, then the question is they'll probably have to go along with it in another country. And then there's an aspect of them judging, look, if you say yes today and you don't fight this, the demands net will, won't stop. And so what is the red line for each company? At the very least, they will have these discussions. And, you know, Twitter might come down on a very different size uh, than, than a Facebook, I think, because of these different factors um, uh, in terms of their kind of you know, market share or market um, uh, markets and valuations, et cetera. So let us end with um, a slightly different ending than normal. It seems in poor taste to do best week, worst week in light of the the pandemic. But, you know, I was struck this week by reading the news. Already we are starting to see stories about who will lead the opposition in 2024. Um, and I, I hypothesize that these stories are going to increase in frequency after Uttar Pradesh goes for elections in early next year. So, Dhanan, let me start with you. As you kind of survey the scene, if you were a betting man um, and you are a columnist, so speculation is good for business, who do you see kind of potentially leading this motley crew of ragtag opposition parties? You know, what's striking about that is there is no obvious candidate. There is nobody who has both the stature and pan-Indian appeal uh, to take on Modi, who comes to mind. Um, my main sort of, uh, I, I think the biggest mistake the opposition could make uh, would be not in choosing, would, be in, would essentially be in choosing to rally behind Rahul Gandhi, declaring that this is his moment. And I think that is really, I mean, we can sort of, you know, laugh about it, but I think that is certainly given the way the Congress thinks, they may believe that finally his time has come because Modi's popularity has been dented. Uh, and, and I think that would be a big mistake. So the question really would be, will the Congress find, find the sagacity to throw its weight behind somebody other than Rahul Gandhi. And that's going to be a very large part of this puzzle. But who that somebody will be uh, or whether they will need a face even, uh, I think those are two things that we don't know yet. I think we can stipulate, Sazan, that, that you believe Rahul Gandhi's time will never come. I, I think that's a fair fair summary of my view. <laughs> <laughs> Sanvi, what about you? Do you see anybody kind of waiting in the wings? Is there a dark horse? Is there someone that we should be paying attention to? And many people have mentioned Sharad Pawar, right, formerly of the Congress, now of the NCP, who is a kind of grand old man of, of regional politics who has a lot of friends across a lot of different parties. Um, Mamta Banerjee, of course, now is in that conversation because of her uh, resounding victory in West Bengal. Uh, any thoughts on this? 
I mean, it's the exact opposite of a columnist where my kind of writing is overly nuanced and tortured. I think it's not, it's always too early to speculate. Um, and there's a big assumption here, right? That the opposition is smart enough to actually coalesce together and around a particular candidate. I mean, I do think there's just so, you know, there's so long between now and the UP election in 2022, let alone. So I think it will depend on really what happens between now and, you know, we've got almost, we have three years. Um, I do think you can identify kind of four broad core categories um, where a candidate could come from. And I think, you know, Sadan mentioned once that whoever the, the head of the Congress party is, you could see second what you mentioned, which is in kind of a grandy acceptable to all. Um, the third I would put as a chief minister who is seen as having delivered on the COVID front and can make the argument that I am on an, the answer to the Tina question, the kind of there is or assertion that there is no alternative. And then finally, um, the other category I could think of, again, I don't know specific, is a technocrat um, that, you know, even though Prime Minister Manmohan Singh wasn't exactly just a technocrat, he'd been in politics and policy for a while, but you could see a technocrat who they, you know, comes as the kind of uh, the compromise candidate because nobody else is going to um, step behind. And if you see an Indian public that really does want somebody who they can say will implement. Now, the other thing is, you can you can figure out which of this category they'll choose. Not necessary that they'll be successful at it. So I'm going to throw a name into the ring, uh, which is Nitish Kumar. Um, Nitish Kumar is the man who has nine lives. He's expended many of them, but maybe not all of them. He is somebody who, despite his long association with the BJP and the NDA, seems to be a palatable candidate for non-Hindutva parties. Um, he may not have pan-Indian recognition, but certainly I think in broad swaths of the country, right, he is somebody who might be seen as a credible candidate. He is uh, not a dynastic politician, right? He is somebody who people say is kind of in touch with, with the grassroots. So he's on my list of, of, of one to watch. Um, he would have to be flipped from the BJP's clutches, but uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot of speculation about that. That's my that's my two cents. He would never flip. That would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> He's never done that. See, in the past. You, you you've you've you can speculate, Tanvi. Um, so well, then, I mean, ha, I, I'm I'm totally kidding because of course he has flipped in the past, and all I mean, you, I can't think of any any consistent politician. <laughs> they've all flipped. Uh, most of these parties are like full of uh, or led by former Congress people, so. Well, we look forward to the column Sadan and the Little Right in 2022, 2023, and 2024 about precisely this question. Um, thanks again, Sadan and Dume of AEI and the Wall Street Journal, Thumbi Madan at the Brookings Institution. Guys, look forward to doing this again. Thanks, Milan. Thank you. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com. India's fastest growing podcasting producing platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, granthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Jonathan Kay, Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.